Good morning, Virginia. This is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial. Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.15. This is Storytime, brought to you by Safe Haven Ministries. I am your host, Brother D. As always, let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our many blessings. We are grateful for all that you've given us this past week. Father, as we get ready to start this new week and we get closer to Easter, please open our hearts, our minds, and our eyes as we remember why we are celebrating this coming holiday. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Duh, Brother D, I know what we're going to do today. I know what we're going to do today. You do, dog. What are we going to do? Duh, you're going to be reading from the Bible today. You're going to be reading from Luke chapter 22 and everything. Uh, but with Easter getting ready to come up, you're, 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 getting ready to, you're getting ready to do stories bringing us in, into the Passover and Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. You're right, dog. We will be. We will be doing that and everything. Also, we need to get on with Pastor Brian and Dave DeVecchi. Duh, yeah, chapter 9, that's what's coming up. That's right, dog, and we're going to start with Pastor Brian this morning, your favorite part of the show, duh, except when you're reading the Bible and everything, then that's my favorite part. But here comes Pastor Brian. Five days later, I drove to Stockton, California. The San Jose Giants, one of the Giants minor league teams, were playing there, and I was the scheduled pitcher. I wanted to go to Phoenix, which is the Giants' top minor league team, but instead I'd be I'd been sent to try A level ball, the lowest rung on the minor league ladder. I had already heard over the radio that the game was sold out. Some of the, the San Francisco radio stations had announced that I'd be pitching. Still I wasn't prepared for what I'd found at the stadium. Fans were lining up two hours before the game. The place buzzed with excitement. I began to realize that this was more than an ordinary minor league baseball game. These fans hadn't come to yell at the umpire and cheer for home runs. Something deeper was involved. These fans had come because my comeback was touching their hearts. They put their hopes on me. At game time, I took time to pray. I bowed my head in front of my locker and was quiet, putting the whole game before God. I told him that I trusted him with my life and that I wanted to glorify him in whatever I did, win or lose. Then I went out to the playing field, and the fans went nuts. It was a standing room only crowd. The stadium wasn't big, but it was bulging. There were extra people everywhere, pressing up against the fence, straining to see, making noise. This was my kind of baseball. I got excited. While I was warming up, the lineups were announced. And on the mound, making his first appearance of the 1989 series, number 43, Dave Dravecki. The fans cheered loudly. By then... I was extremely nervous. It was a minor league game, but I had major league jitters. Our guys came up first. An outfielder named Jim Cooper bonded his way on. Hustling all the way, he stole second, and the number three hitter singled him home. When I ran out to the pitcher's mound for my half of the inning, we were leading one to zero. I towed the rubber and Took a deep breath. I got the side from my catcher, then wound up and threw. The batter swung and got a piece of it, fouling the ball back. Strike one. I threw again. Another foul. Strike two. The third pitch he hit for a weak fly ball. The left fielder gathered it gently in, and I had my first out. It felt great. This was something I knew how to do. And it was fun. Two ground ball outs later, I was in the dugout, kidding around with the guys. People told me later 
They had never seen someone have so much fun playing baseball. It wasn't an act. I was having fun. I went through the first three innings without giving up a hit. My fastball was crisp, mainly in the low 80s, but topping out at 88 miles per hour. In the fourth inning, I gave up my first hit, a single to left. That gave me a chance to use my pickoff move. My first throw over to first was a little off target. I hadn't practiced the move at all and was rusty. I looked in at my catcher and he signaled for me to throw over to first again. I came to the set, looked at the runner, and when I made my throw, he was already headed to second. Completely fooled, we cut him down. That got my juices flowing. The fifth and sixth innings went quickly, except that I was beginning to feel tired. My pitches were coming up, which is always dangerous for me. I escaped any problems until the seventh, the final inning. Because we were playing the first part of the doubleheader, the game was shorter than usual. The first batter I faced in the seventh smoked a double. I got the next man on a little fly ball, but by then my arm was weary and my control going fast. I walked the next hitter, putting the tying run on the base. A terrible thing to do. The sun was almost down. Deep green and golden colors painted the field. I took a deep breath and delivered to the batter. He was bunting on the first pitch trying to move the runners into scoring position. He squared and made a good bunt down the third baseline. Good in placement, but he had popped the ball into the air. My instincts kicked in. I took two quick steps, lunging steps, and made an all-out headlong dive for it, extending my mitt. I thought I could catch the ball before it hit the ground and double off one of the runners. I got the ball and watched it pop loose out of my glove. Getting to my knees, I grabbed the ball and pumped towards second. I saw I I would be late. The runner from first was already sliding. Danny Fernandez, my catcher, was beside me screaming, third, third. I threw it there with force. The runner who had hesitated too long They dived for the ball. Out number two. Boy, did I feel good. This was real baseball. And I was a quick pitcher. I was a real pitcher. Playing the only way I know how. All out. Nothing held back. I'd gotten my uniform dirty. I don't even know. I don't even remember. How I got the last out. I just remember all the players gathering on the mound, slapping me and yelling as though we had won a playoff game. The crowd was yelling too. When I searched through my baseball memories, I don't find a game happier than that one. I was on top of the world. I played my next game for the... San Jose Giants in Reno, Nevada. Reno Stadium was old and battered. For this game, however, it was nearly full. Once again, people had heard about my comeback from cancer and wanted to see for themselves. I started without good control. Immediately, I gave up some shots. And then a three-run home run. Some of the Reno players had been in double-A baseball and knew how to hit. It did not look good. I made some adjustments, though, and settled down in the second and third innings, avoiding giving up more runs. My guys got some runs back, and we went into the lead. Then in the fourth inning, as though the floodlights had suddenly switched on, it happened. I locked in. Up until then, even in Stockton, I hadn't felt it. I'd been all right, but this was better than all right. I felt I could hit a spot with my eyes closed. 
My breaking ball started snapping. For the last five innings, I shut down the Reno team. I completed the game, throwing about 100 pitches, and we won 7-3. to three. I came off the mound and told Dwayne Espy, the manager, that's it, Dwayne, I'm ready for Phoenix. He laughed and said, are you sure? I could use you around here for a few more games. I called up Al Rosen, the Giants' general manager. He said I could move up to Phoenix, the highest level of the Giants' minor league system. If I did well there, the next step would be the major leagues. Now that the end of my struggle was in sight, it was tempting to forget about living one day at a time. I wanted to get to the big leagues badly. I could see it. I could taste it. That is why before the Friday game, I took time to pray. I didn't ask God for success. I asked that he either swing the door to the major leagues wide open or slam it shut. I didn't want anything left unclear. My desire to succeed was so strong, I thought I might push myself into a situation I wasn't really ready for, either physically or spiritually. The way the game went, there was no doubt about which way the door was swinging. The pitching was the best yet. I didn't give up a run until the eighth inning. I didn't walk a soul. I got Major Leaguer Kevin Bass out. He was in the minor leagues like me, recuperating from an injury. And I was locked in with the old, familiar feeling. In the eighth inning, I got rocketed a bit, giving up two runs. In the dugout, the manager asked me whether I wanted to stay in the game. We were clinging to a run, one-run lead. I hesitated. This baby's mine. I told him, I'm closing. That's all there is to it, bud. I'm going to win or lose this game. I went out and shut them out, shut them down. We won the game three to two. I had given up seven hits, struck out three, and walked none. After the game, I made a beeline into the clubhouse. I was looking for Bob Kennedy. He had come down from San Francisco just to see me pitch. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, did you talk to Al Rosen? He walked up to me slowly, a little smile playing on his face. <laughs> yes, I talked to him. I just got off the phone. What did he say? Don't you think I'm ready to go up to the big leagues? His voice grew softer. Well, Dave... We think you probably had better stick around at this level for a little longer. If you can get a little more work, maybe a few more games. I dropped to my knees. I knew he was messing with me. Please, Mr. Kennedy, I'm ready. I want to go. Please send me to San Francisco. He looked, at, looked down at me with a little smile. Pack your bags, he said. Get out of here. Get your flight to San Francisco first thing tomorrow. You're going to the big leagues. Duh, we want to thank Pastor Brian and everything. And uh, we'll, ha we'll have chapter 10 starting pitcher for y'all next week. <laughs> That's right, dog. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks. I still got that cough and everything. Sorry about that. Let us go to Luke chapter 22 as we get ready for Easter coming up at the end of the month and every day. And we'll be going through all this and y'all enjoy as we get ready to start with Luke chapter 22. Verse 1, it says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes thought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains, how that he may betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to pray him, betray him to, in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread, 
when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There, make ready. And then they went and found it just as he said to them, and they prepared the Passover. Die. You, you you stop and think, brother D. J, 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 Jesus Jesus is getting ready getting ready to uh, basically be crucified and and everything, and he's following just what the Bible had said and prophesizing about him. That's right, dog. Now, as we go on and everything, when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them. With fervent desire, I desire to eat this Passover view before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and says, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and said to them, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which I shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Duh. You, you stop and think, Brother D. He, he's, telling them, he's telling them that he's getting ready to go to the cross, and, and they, they don't understand. That's right, dog. But you also think about this, you know, many people talk about what they would do if they had one day to live. You know, they talk about they'd eat a bunch of junk food, maybe go to King's Dominion, get on that scary ride that they never had the nerve to get on. You know, they'd be talking about all this, but you stop and think, what did Jesus do? And he knew he only had one more day to live. Duh. He, 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 he clothed himself as a servant and he washed the feet of the disciples because nobody had made made arrangements for that because at that time when you come into into the room or into the house somebody was there with a pitcher of water and a towel to 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 wash your dusty feet that's right though jesus clothed himself as a servant and he washed the feet of his disciples but that's the thing remember jesus jesus was telling them you know to be a servant and everything and everything but then we go on with Verse 23, then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as a younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Uh, you you got to stop and think Jesus is telling them what, what's going to happen afterwards. And he's making a promise that if they stay true and everything and faithful, that they'll be with him in the heaven. That's right, dog. That's one of the things. But as we go on, you got to stop and think there's coming, there's coming some real issues and some hard times. And as we go on with verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith shall not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to both prison and to death. And then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times, deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. 
Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written shall be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And then they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. Coming out. He went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also with him. And when he got, when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you do not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. Duh. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane and everything on the Mount of Olives, didn't he, Brother T? That's right, dog. He was, he was at his favorite place there on the Mount of Olives the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's about to ask God a serious question. Duh. Yeah, you need to go on with verse 42, Brother D. That's right. As he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And when his sweat became like great drops of blood dropping on, on the ground, when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near Jesus to kiss him. Die, yeah. J- Judas was bringing all them from the chief, chief priest and everything and all. He he's bringing a mob. That's right, dog. He's bringing a mob. And you know what he told the mob, don't you? Die, yeah. He t- he told them that the one that I kiss, he is the one that you need to take. That's right. And as we go on with verse forty-eight, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. And having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courthouse and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But Peter denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Now, after a little while, another saw him and said, You are also of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Duh, P- Peter's about to get himself in trouble, isn't he, Brother D? Well, that's just it, dog. Jesus had told him he'd deny him three times. You've already heard two of the denials. Duh, yeah, you need to go on with it, Brother D. And in verse 59, then after an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. We can tell by his speech. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're saying. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. But Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Duh. Yep. Uh, P- P- Peter realized he made a mistake, didn't he, Brother D? That's right, dog. Peter was very, very arrogant. And it, he, he was always boasting and carrying on. Now suddenly he's a broken man. But you can imagine when Jesus turned and looked at him, it was probably with a look of love. It wasn't the look that said, I told you so. He was telling Peter... I'm sorry for what's happened, but you're about to learn a bitter lesson, and then you will be able to go on and do what I ask you to do. Duh, yeah. And verse 46 is where we, or 64 is where we left off, Brother D. No, no, it was verse 63 is where we left off, dog. 
Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him, and having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one that struck you? And many other things they blasphemy spoke against him. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will know, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will say, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit at the right hand of the power of God. And then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? And he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Duh. You, you, you stop and think, Brother D. Uh, they, 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 they've accused him and falsely accused him and everything. That's right, dog. That was the thing. You know, Judas had betrayed him. They had to take him where the people would not be able to see what was going on. But here's the thing. They had a mob all ready to go and everything. Kind of like a flash mob today. Only they, they took them a little bit to get it together. The thing is, they had people who were trying to basically testify against Jesus and everything. And they couldn't get their act together. Their false witnesses couldn't tell a straight story. You know, a couple of them finally said, well, he said he would tear down the temple and then build it without hands. You know, they, they went trying to find anything. They had to lie to be able to accuse Jesus of anything and everything. Duh, yeah, and, and now now they're getting ready to take him to Pilate, aren't they, Brother D? That's right, dog, and we will continue next week with Luke 23, and we're going to go on, and, you know, that's one of the great things about the story of the resurrection. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was in the grave during the Sabbath. He rested. And when he come forth on Sunday morning, he arose the conqueror. He arose out of that grave. And now we have the promise of a resurrection. We have a risen Savior that we serve. Duh, yeah, and you need to look at the time, Brother D. You're right, dog. Let us in with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for our many blessings. We are grateful for the greatest gift you ever gave the world, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, as we get ready to prepare for Easter, help us to open our Bibles and open our hearts and our minds and let us pray for, for the Holy Spirit to guide us as we study your word. Help us, Father, and we are grateful for all that you've given us. And we are especially grateful that you have given us the greatest book and the greatest gift. You gave us the Bible and you gave us your son, Jesus to help us understand the Bible, and to know that you love us and have great mercy upon us. All of this we are grateful for in Jesus' name. Amen. Duh, folks, if you like what you hear on the radio, you can call us at 434-390-5981. That, that's 434-390-5981. That's right, folks, or you can email us at emtx. 3XL at gmail.com. Again, that is E-M-T-X. 3XL at gmail.com. As always, folks, we'd like to remind you, WGFW is a Christian radio station. You hear no advertising on this radio station. It is solely funded by you, the listener. We ask that you send your donations to God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Again, that's God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Duh, folks. Uh, we'd also like to thank Safe Haven Ministries that has been sponsoring us and keeping us on the air as well. And, and we're grateful to you all for keeping us on the air for the last seven years. We celebrated our anniversary last week. That's right, dog. It wasn't exactly that Sunday. Many seven years ago we started. But it was the week. We're very happy that we've been able to continue and bring God's word and open these stories and hopefully open some eyes and some hearts. 
the the folks and, and, and we need to remind you all uh if you didn't set your clocks ahead last night uh you're an hour behind because daylight saving time has started that's right folks we need to remind everybody if you didn't leap ahead you're now behind because that clock that you're looking at if you didn't set it one hour ahead last night you're you're looking at a you're gonna be late for church or whatever else you got to do today. Once again, folks, this is WGFW eighty eight point seven on the FM dial. The time is nine forty five. We return you to the regular broadcast. The folks, remember we said it's nine forty five. If you're looking into your clock and it says eight forty five, you need to run it ahead. And may your week be blessed.